It's the nation's favourite antiques expert. All right, fair enough. It's a really cute subject. Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> Make it so. Here we go. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Frankly terrifying. <laughs> The aim Ooh. to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's yeah. no mean feat. I've lost money. There'll be worthy winners. <laughs> Get in there! And valiant losers. Could have been worse. Will it be the high road to glory? Ooh. Or the slow road to disaster? <laughs> this is the Antiques Road Trip. Top dollar. It's the sound of a new road trip. Time to slip back in the G-plan, tune up your G-strings and play along with two cool dudes. Well, use your imaginations. Antiques guru, auctioneer Phil Serrell and coin expert Tim Medhurst are our new friends in the north. You know what? I feel so lucky to be on the road with the legend of Rosebud. <laughs> Two young, vibrant, yeah, happy, smiley, cheerful men in our prime. Millennials. Yeah. Yeah. What did you say? Men in their what? Prime. Oh right. Okay. No one ever said that about me. <laughs> Old before your time. Is that is that a fair comment? Or well, I you? have been told that I was born forty-two. I was born in nineteen forty-two. Were you? No. 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 Tim, please. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That could have been the end of a beautiful friendship before we've even started. <laughs> They'll be rivals soon enough. With £200 apiece, Phil and Tim will be attacking the Antiques Emporia of Northumberland. They will head north before hot-footing it back down south and finishing their trip at auction in Nottingham. On this trip, their sights are set on auction in the Scottish capital. Do you know what? I'm not sure if this car's going to make it to Scotland. Do you not? Well, try it, you know. It, it is the oldest make of motor car. Biblical. Oh, really? Yeah. Because if you read the Bible, it says, Moses came down the hill in his triumph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Glad I'm along for the ride. This stylish Mustard Triumph Herald convertible was built in 1971. Are we sitting comfortably? I had one of those in white. In the middle of the driver's seat, there's a, a rather protruding spring. Oh, well, I won't tell you where it protrudes to. That sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> but a lot of people would pay jolly good money for it. <laughs> oh, dear. Very 70s. <laughs> it is very, very 1970s, though, this car, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes you realise how much you appreciate power steering, ABS brakes, a roof, a heater that works... And no wine! You, Phil, not the car. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Northumbria is a land of big seascapes, beautiful beaches, fairy tale castles, and dramatic lighthouses to soak up in the sunshine. And first stop today is the pretty harbour village of Amble. Hey, look, this is my first shop. And actually, we could do with some fuel. We could, couldn't we? I might leave you to do the hard work. I'm going to do the fun bit. <laughs> right. See you later, Phil. Good luck. Yeah. While Phil struggles to get out of the car and put a tiger in his tank... There we go. Tim's off to prowl round the delightful Circa Cafe, which serves up an interesting selection of antiques and vintage along with a nice slice of cake. Hmm, maybe later. Yummy. Now, I think Phil and I need one of these for the car. Look at that. This road map is 1920s, printed during the reign of George V, basically 100 years ago. Ordnance Survey road map of Harrogate, Leeds and Bradford. I think our first auction is in Scotland, so probably not the best place to take a map from somewhere else. Indeed. Keep looking. Do you know who that reminds me of is um, Philip Celery. <laughs> Philip Celery. Ha ha. Talking of Phil Celery, let's catch up with our favourite crispy, tasty vegetable. He's heading a few miles north to the ancient market town of Annick. Dominated by its fantastic castle, where the Dukes of Northumberland once rallied their forces for fighting Scottish border lords. Today it's famous as the setting for Harry Potter's fictional battles with his arch enemy, Voldemort. Having parked the broomstick, Phil's off to the beehive, 
and presided over today by owner Mark. Eleven dealers sell their antique and vintage stock here, and oh yes, they love bees. Time to get busy! I was in Devon last week and I bumped into a Dalek and I said, where are you from? And he said, Exeter, mate. Exeter, mate. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I'll poke him with my sonic screwdriver. I will! I quite like this. I mean, this says it's a, an oaky ear trumpet. I don't know that's an ear trumpet, do you? Hello? So I think this is probably something like a speaker off a kind of Edison gem record player or it might even be off a, off a ship, something like that. But I think that would make be great. Block that on a bit of wood, put a speaker in there, Bluetooth your smartphone to it. What a really cool speaker that is. I'd play all the current stuff on there, like Bill Haley and that young up-and-coming band, the Rolling Stones. A possibility done at £30. Any more for any more? Their shot puts now, what you do is your shot put, you put it there like that, under the chin like that, and that leg has to go out like that. You chassis across the ring, and then you throw it as far as you can, which these days actually is not very far. But these are 15 quid, and a lot of people think they're cannonballs, but they're not, they're shot puts. I taught PE in geography, would you believe? So I did shot put, I did 400 metres, 100 metres. Um, I was at college the same time as a chap called Sebastian Coe. No, Phil, I think you'll find he was at college with you. <laughs> Let's leave our former PE teacher to ponder and see whether Tim is any further forward in Amble. He's a funny chap. <laughs> oh, dear. I always think that if something makes you laugh, then it's probably worth buying, and I really, really like this. You can see here, he's a little golfer. He's got his little golfing club here. And what it is, is a Vesta slash ashtray. And his hat here, you'd put your matches. And then on the front is a striker where you would strike your matches. And then that's for the ash there from your um, cigarette. He's missing an eye though, which is a shame. On his left leg here is a registration mark. So it says R, D, N. And then there's a number there which you could look up and date it to exactly when it was patented. Um, I would imagine during the Edwardian period, maybe even around 1910. It's had a lot of use because once upon a time, this would have been completely plated in a nickel silver. And it's just been worn and used and used until his eyes fallen out. <laughs> but it leaves just <laughs> quite a fun little ornament. There's a few different collecting fields for this. There's golf memorabilia, and there's people that collect vestas, and just interesting early 20th century metalware. So I just think he's fun. And the price is 10 pounds. I'm in, I'm gonna buy that, I love it. An Hello. owner, Nicola, will Hello. surely be glad to sell it to you. Let me give you the money for it, 10 pounds. Lovely. I've got that in my pocket, there we are. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank right. you. I think that's a hole in one. And having parted with a modest £10 for the first purchase of the trip, he's away. Now, nine miles up the road, Phil seems to be making his way to the counter. That's a relief. Actually, those are quite funny there, aren't they? Can you I get those out? Yeah, 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 that's open. Just put it out. So these are, are they lead or tin? I suspect they're probably tin. And what are they, like Romans or something? <laughs> I think they're maybe Gauls. It's a box of German vintage soldiers made in Kiel, priced at £40. I've actually seen sets of these. Have you? Yeah. And they did circus animals, they did farmyard scenes, they did all sorts of things. What would be the best price for these here, the shop puts and the speaker? I'll go 35 Okay. on those. £35, pounds. you're an absolute gentleman. Very sporting prices, 15 each for the shot puts and the painted figures, and five for the horn. Me thinks Mr. Serrell played a bit of a blinder here. I'm really pleased because I've, I've got the horn. <laughs> oh, isn't he sweet when he's happy? Meanwhile, Tim's headed north to the town of Berwick-upon-Tweed, the northernmost town in England. 
Northumberland's extensive coal fields powered the Industrial Revolution and entire communities depended on the hard and dangerous work down the mines for their living. Tim has come to this long-established Berwick Bakery to discover more about a lost recipe that helped to power the miners themselves. Hello, you must be Jim. Hello, Tim. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice Welcome to, meet to you. Berwick. Now, I've heard there's a local delicacy around here. Yes. And you're the man to show it to me. Yes, it certainly is. It's a singing henny. It's basically like a scone. Oh, right. But the way it's done is totally different. It's not, it's not cooked in an oven. It's cooked on a girdle. Mm -hmm. So you've got a hot plate, and then you turn it over. Right. It also allegedly sings. When you, as soon as you flip it over, all the fat rushes back down again, and it starts squeaking, and it starts sizzling. <laughs> the high lard content had them singing since at least 1825, when they were described in a glossary of North Country words. But enlighten a ninny. Why it's called a hinny. It's a slang. This was back in the day and the our kids was wanting fed. So uh, uh, mum was tea ready, tea ready, and we should shout back, tea will not be ready to the singing henny. And henny is just honey. Yeah. Jim Ford's grandparents have been making hennies here since opening the family bakery in 1949. But today, they're made with the addition of sugar and without the traditional lard. The fat content and the old singing henny is almost identical to the flour, you know, so you get almost the same ratio. Mm -hmm. That'll keep you probably alive in the Arctic. If Why were they first made? What was the purpose of them? If you're a miner, you know, that'd be a real tough job, yeah. actually, you know, a real tough job. And you could carry that, you know, down the mine with you, so it's totally portable. And if you're hungry, you went one of those would keep, keep you going, going keep you going all day, just about, you know. They are very buttery and must never be absent from the table of a genuine pitman, wrote German travel writer Johann George Cole in 1844. Using the old family secrets of Jim's granddad's traditional recipe, it's time for our Tim to recreate this mighty working class stodge fest. So, stand by your defibrillator. So one lard and two butter. Yeah. And yeah. How, how many do you think that would make? I would say it would make maybe about 10. So every, every one, you're approximately eating a third of one of those? Yeah. I don't think the apron would fit. <laughs> Jim makes a moat with his crumb mixture of fat and flour. Then just a little bit at a time. Milk in the middle. Serious wrist action required for the dough. Remember the currants? It's like those fly ribbons. <laughs> and shape into patties. Yeah, just flatten it out now. Right, Jim, should we put one on the... Uh... Yeah. You want me to go first? Yeah, or? go on, you go first. Show me how it's done. I'll learn from the master. <laughs> right, now the singing part. Oh, look at that. Listen for Pavarotti. Not a peep. I can hear a pigeon. <laughs> Come on, sing. Sing to me. And then just go for it. Maybe lard was louder in the past. The collieries are all closed now. An industry which employed thousands and a way of life fading into the past. Along with them, the hinny of Jim's granddad's day has all but disappeared. But Little Red Riding Hood is taking the basketful he's made to a local tea room that serves modern style hinnies to see what folk make of the old lard based recipe. I was just wondering, like would that. you like to try one of the hinnies I made? Wait, you Are you a fan yeah. of the hinny? Oh, yes, yes. I like the hinny. You good. do? Yeah. Thank you. Digging straight in. Oh my word. Very nice. Is it? Very nice. You couldn't eat more than half a dozen at a time. No, definitely not. <laughs> no, it's not bad. I quite like that. Well, you can have I've got a whole basket I made here. You <laughs> can have them for a, a pound each. <laughs> a pound each, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully he'll make more from his antiques. Right, let's see what the big bad wolf is up to. I very much hope that the spring is not giving him too much trouble. Isn't this just the best view ever? I mean, just look at that. Absolutely fantastic. Boy, are we ever lucky to do this. Yep. And is he getting the measure of his new companion? I really, really like working with Tim. The only thing that bothers me a little bit is that I've got socks older than him. 
it's Grandad's last chance today to use the experience of all those extra decades to snap up something a callow youth can only envy. Phil is off to the foot of the Cheviots and the bonny town of Wooler. At Borders Architectural Antiques, owner Gordon Gell is at the ready. This place is stuffed with impressive statues, grand furniture and quality paintings. Not sure how far his £165 will go. There's just really cool things in this place. And you've got everything from lumps of stone to mirrors. But this is a slightly different mirror because this is a Masonic mirror. And if you look at this, you've got the square and compasses, which are Masonic emblems. And down here, you've got the plumb rule. And the two columns are surmounted by celestial and terrestrial globes. And so you've got all this symbolism within a mirror. So this isn't going to have a value just because it's a mirror. It's going to have a value because it's a Masonic mirror. Gordon, I think this is really interesting. How much is this, please? It's £200, Phil. £200. Ouch! Phil will have to reflect on his budget. Looks like he'll have to turn his gaze elsewhere. Yeah, I saw another mirror there. How much is that mirror, please? 195. 1810. Can I borrow a pound, please? <laughs> so if you want to judge an old bit of glass, stick a coin on it like that. And if it's an old piece of glass, the depth between the reflection and the actual coin will be much deeper than a modern piece of glass. So there's a bit of a tip. And on a mirror, I think it's actually... I suppose you want this back. Right, OK. OK. So 1810 is Regency period. That's right. And you can tell that's Regency by, A, those sort of half-round cluster columns either side of it and above it, and also the moulding in the corner is sometimes termed a bell push, isn't it? That's right. I quite like that. Could that come for a tickle under 100? A tickle. Gordon, I'm pleased with that. Thank you very much. And a tickle under £100 means £95. <laughs> Gentlemen, your day is done and it's time to head for the hills. Thoughts are already turning to the full Scottish. Square sausage. Square sausage. Yeah. With a fry-up. Yeah. They have extra bits, don't they? Do you I honestly think, so. think, looking at my... I'm a fry-up man. I mean, No, please, not at all. This is a temple. I think you're a yoghurt and fruit I'm man. I've got the body of a god. Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> Black pudding for me every time. Nighty night. Good morning, Scotland. That is really, really gorgeous, isn't it? It's not the Seven or the Thames, is it? I don't think it's the Thames. No. It doesn't come this far north, does it, the Thames? No. Nope. It's the Tweed. Glad I never had him for geography. I could turn that into a coffee table. You could. That's a bit of you That there, is a but... coffee table. If ever I saw a coffee table in waiting, that That's is That's a big it. old coffee table it for is, you. Isn't it? Maybe we should pop in and see if you can buy one. Yesterday, Tim bought an Edwardian Vesta ashtray sporting a golfing figure. I always think that if something makes you laugh, then it's probably worth buying. And sets out today with £190 to spend. While Phil splurged on a fancy Regency mirror. I'd have this at home because I think it's a really cool mirror. And after throwing money at two shop puts, some German painted figures and a metal horn speaker, he's left with £70. That's a periscope. Oh, it's an ear trumpet. Yeah, it's a horn. Pardon? It's a horn. Well, the horn wasn't working. The horn on doesn't work, so I thought I ought to buy a horn. What do you think of that? I love um, 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 we could go canvassing, couldn't we? Vote made us! <laughs> Vote Medhurst, <laughs> your ticket for the future. After ditching his election agent, Tim's travelling through Walterscott country, inching ever closer to Edinburgh. He's in the Tweed Valley, where St Ronan is said to have sailed his coracle upstream in the year 737 to found the town of Inner Leithen. A 
ABK Antiques, presided over by owner Brian, is a treasure trove that might yield some fine loot. Just found quite a nice Japanese pot, and it's called a koro, which was mainly for burning incense. This one would date to around the late 19th century, maybe even the early 20th century at the end of the Meiji period. And it's got a little turned wood cover as well, which is quite sweet. And when you think that was made over 100 years ago, and the skill involved in firing cloisonne enamel, the very top quality pieces were made with gold. This one looks to be on a base metal like brass, but still a beautiful quality thing and would have taken a lot of effort to make. But I've just felt with my fingers around the back and it has got a nasty bash one side, which is a real shame. I think in perfect condition in an auction, you might be looking at maybe around the 100 to 150 pounds mark. But with that damage, it's gonna be nearer the 30 to 50 pounds mark and it's priced up at 30 pounds. So maybe with a bit of negotiating, it could stand a chance. Maybe something to put down and think about because I've only just got here and there is stuff hidden everywhere. So I'm quite excited just to have a look around. I'm a bit flushed myself. What else may get his pulse racing? Now, I like that a lot. It's a Victorian barometer, but it looks like it's a bit of church furniture. It's got this beautiful Gothic arch. It's made of oak, nicely carved with these two roses. I would imagine dates to around 1850 to 1870, that sort of period. And if you have an interest in Gothic architecture, this is the perfect little barometer to have. Money-wise, we are looking at 42 pounds. I think in an auction, that stands a chance because I think it'll be a fair auction with stormy bidding. Can't wait. I'm definitely going to take it, but I'm going to pop it up there because there's so much to see. Is there more than? This is a really nice knife strop or knife board, and you can imagine this hanging in a Victorian kitchen or butchers over 100 years ago, and you could sharpen your knives quite easily on a daily basis. And it's just built up over a long time, a really nice patination. Also, I do like that up here, it's got the arms of Glasgow. The auction is in Edinburgh, not a million miles away. And the price is 22 pounds. I think that has got to be a buy. Time to go and chat to Brian. Let's see what we can do. Brian, how are you doing? How do you do? Nice to see you. There's the knife strop and that's priced at 22. And there's the Gothic Barometer, that's priced up at 42. And there's a little Japanese Koro, 30 pounds. That's priced up at 94 pounds. 94, that's good maths. If I took all three off your hands, what sort of price do you think we'd be talking? What would the price would you? Ideally, uh -huh. in an ideal world, 60 pounds. 60 pounds. Mm. 60 pounds, I think. Are you sure? Yeah, sure. Okay. It's a deal. Thank you so much. See, there we are. 20 pounds each for those three, and I suspect Mr. Medhurst is right to look pleased with himself. Nice work. Phil, meanwhile, is out and about in the rolling hills of the borders of Ancrum near Jedburgh. Like most of Britain, lowland Scotland is crisscrossed with thousands of miles of hedgerows, which depend for their upkeep and conservation on the traditional skills of hedge layers like Graham Walker. Like, oh, you're good to see him. Like, oh, I love a man with a dog. That's Hamish. Yeah, he's half deaf, fully blind, and about 107 year old. Yeah, I I'm familiar with two of those bits. Yeah. <laughs> and, and these are all your old tools. These are all hedge laying tools, Phil, yeah. I'm just about to start uh, doing a bit of traditional hedge laying on a uh, field boundary just behind us down the hill. Hedgerows have been marking field boundaries since the enclosures of common land began in the Middle Ages. For centuries, farm labour was plentiful and cheap and maintaining hedges was part of the job. But 20th century mechanisation brought a decline in traditional skills like hedge laying. Post-war, there was a great move to pulling them all out. But recently, the past few decades, that folly has been fully understood. Why do you say folly? Because basically, the hedge row is so important, particularly in an arable landscape like yeah. this, where it's really the only sanctuary for wildlife, right. as well as performing the traditional functions of being a stock-proof barrier. It is essentially a living fence if it's laid in the traditional fashion. It also acts as a 
permeable barrier to water, so you slow down the transit of water, and particularly in flood-prone areas. Thankfully, there were those who recognised what was being lost. In the 70s, people were concerned that it was going to disappear completely in a organisation called the National Hedge Laying Society right, yeah. uh, was set up to try and preserve the craft for the future and to teach youngsters how to lay hedges. And it's burgeoned since then. And now we're planting miles and miles of new hedgerow every year. So we're getting back to somewhere along the way of where we were before. So let's see what a hedge which hasn't been maintained looks like. What we've got here, Phil, is exactly what you're going to find throughout the UK is a typical post-war hedge that's not been managed properly since then. All that's happened to it is it's been continually flailed by machine. The top's been thrashed off it. That's it, you can see that here. This one's recently been done, and at the top it just becomes this knitted mass, but nothing will grow at the bottom there. You won't get any thickening at the bottom. It just gaps out to this extent that it's now no longer useful as a stock-proof barrier, because sheep can just pass straight through there. It's not shelter-proof, so it doesn't give any windbreak. Yeah. And there's no habitat, there's no cover for the small mammals, the, the low nesting birds, the ground nesting birds. Do you notice the wildlife that's coming back into hedgerows that you've done? You do, and it's almost instant. As soon as I start to lay a hedge, I notice the wee birds popping in and looking, because there's a whole different environment being created, and they're interested and they want to get in about it. And that must be hugely satisfying. Oh, greatly, yeah, yeah. Particularly when you come back later on and you see the growth in the next season, and then season two and three, and it's just blooming. Time to get to work on a hedge that Graham's already started laying. Right, Phil, you'll need that. Oh, I was going to take the other one. Oh, you're going to have the other one? OK. Yeah, no, I want that one. You want the Yorkshire? Is that yours? Yeah. You That's a Yorkshire two-handed bill hook. Bill hook? One for you, Phil. Really? Yeah. Save your eyes. You probably want that as well. We, we are playing baseball, then. Yeah, Hesler's mitt. Mr Searle, with that bill hook, should be something to behold. We'll lay this stem here, so we'll do what's called pleaching it. Pleach. And then we'll, we'll pleach it, right. which is to cut it partially through, and then you can have a go at doing the next one. Does that not kill it all? No, what happens here is this one's already been pleached, as you can see. Yeah. This is still attached, and that's a living hinge. And that'll grow? That will grow, yeah, but most of the growth will come off this stump here. It'll start to bud all the way around there and grow up vertically like that. And then along this pleacher, and they now call this a pleacher once it's been pleached, yep. it will start to bud here and bud there and bud there. And the whole thing will knit together, become very thick, very vigorous, and a really healthy hedge. OK, let me at it. Stand back, stand back. That goes on there, that goes there. There. That's it. You're almost there. That's it. And that goes down. If you put that one in there like that, and then you want And mine comes the other side? The other side, exactly. So what comes next then? You need to get a stake. And you just welt that in there, do you? Yeah, so that will go down through there between these two stems. Then you whack that in. You whack that in with the mallet. So you then get this thing here. The binder. Would that go like that? That would be going in underneath that one there. And then over there like that? That's it, over that one there and then inside that side there. And then we repeat that process all the way down. That's really cool, isn't it? I'm going to pack in auctioneer and all this antique stuff. I'm up for this now. Oh, yeah, you've got the skills. Sorry, could you just say it one more time? You've got the skills. On that note, thank you and good night. This is Sir and Sarah from the borders of Scotland, Hedge Lane. While Phil's been auditioning as a presenter for Country File, ha! Tim's been getting ahead in the race southwest to their last shop in Hoyk. Reaving may have been over in these parts for centuries, but there's still scope for getting one over your rival. The Borders Antiques and Decorative Interior Centre houses a fantastic selection of wares displayed in style. I hope they don't mind having their drawers sniffed. I spy a lesser spotted Cyril, and I think Tim must have spotted him as well because he's now browsing like a man possessed. Can't keep up? Let's follow Uncle Phil. This is a lovely little table. This is made out of satin wood. 
it's kind of Edwardian Sheraton revival period. So this is all meant to look like it's inlaid, but it's painted. And in the middle, we've got this central medallion, and then we've got these swags and ribbons of foliage. And then if you look around here, you've got this wonderful painted frieze, and you've got harebells running down their legs. Now, the first thing you want to look for with something like this is damage, because unlike me, this has got really fine, delicate legs, and these are prone to breaking. But if you have a close look, there isn't any damage there. I think that's a really nice thing. There isn't a price ticket on it, so I've got to go and have a word with the dealer in a minute to see where we can go. But I want to have another look round before. If I can find something else, that would be ideal. So it would. Meanwhile, has Tim slowed down long enough to spot anything yet? This is a death medallion, and it was given to the next of kin of any serviceman or woman that died during the First World War. And this one was awarded to a man called Alfred Samuel Foster. The original design for these was a competition. People had to submit a design. And one man, Edward Carter Preston, won the competition and he had the commission of designing this medal. And down here, we've got the Lion of Britain devouring the Eagle of Germany. And around the edge, we've got, he died for freedom and honor. It's a price of 35 pounds, which is very, very reasonable for one of these. There's a certain profit there, I think. So I'd be wrong to turn it down. Morris, how are you? Well, thank you. Good to see you. This is priced at 35. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say, what's your best price? 30. It's a deal. Quick deal, 30 pounds. Thank you very much. Oh. And that seems to be Tim, all set for sale in Edinburgh. But what about Uncle Phil? These are cool. Look. Ceremonial truncheons, I just love these. 19th century, it would have made out of turned wood. If you look here, you've got the crown and you've got VR, which is for Victoria. The problem is, it's a, there's a lot of rub in there. There's no price on them, but we go a lot by weight in this business and you can't feel it at home. But this one, which is much better quality, it's actually a lot heavier. These weren't meant to be used to bash people on the old beanie. They're ceremonial, they're not bonce bashers. Bonce bashers, that's a road trip first. Time to talk to Maurice. How much are those, please? They're 60 pound a pair. And how much is that, please? 75. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to play this slightly differently. I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you which, I'm going to tell you what I've got left. 20, 40, 60, there's 70 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. I'd really like to, if I could, to buy a table and a truncheon. Go on, then. I'm going to shake you on really quickly. Are you sure? Yeah, go on. You're an absolute stoller, thank you. There's that, there's that, there's that. Thank you very I much. I am so pleased with that. Only because it's you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Oh, Tim, it's going to rain. Hurry up. Quick. Timbo, Timbo. Next stop, Old Riki, after some shut eye. The ancient crags and ramparts of the Scottish capital are glowering impressively this morning. But the sun may come out later for the tourists thronging the Royal Mile and fortune may shine on our foot soldiers as they arrive with high hopes of victory at the auction house of Ramsey Cornish. Oh, I wonder how my golfer's going to do. I'm quite excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. Are you going to end up in the bunker or perhaps you can get an eagle with it? Mm, as long as I don't get a bogey. <laughs> <laughs> well, a double bogey would be even worse, wouldn't it? Watch your swing, gentlemen. The buyers are duly assembled and the game is about tee off. Phil emptied his pockets completely of his £200 on five lots. Phil is really appealing to the decorative market with this one. I love this. Regency mirror, we're talking early 19th century, 200 years old, and it looks like it's got its original gilding and the moulding is in good condition as well. I really like that. Mmm, me too. Our canny man divested himself of, but half his budget, £100 on his five lots. If you want to sell a bit of golfing kit, bring it to Scotland. So I think this is a really clever buy of Tim's. I mean, so you like my golfer? Yeah, I do. He's making you laugh. It just makes you smile, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a very sophisticated piece of shed art, almost. Don't isn't be rude it? about it. No, he's I'm not, not. He's not made in a shed. How much was he? A whole ten pound note. I think, Master Timothy, that you are going to do really well with that. Thanks, Uncle Phil. Five, seventy-five, 
Let's ask auctioneer Martin Cornish what he fancies will do well today. Nice death plaque. It's in good condition, which helps as well. It would be useful to have the medals with it, but it's not essential. I think it will do well. For collectors out there, the little tiny figures are really, really nice. And we found over the last year, anything to do with militaria or small figures seems to do really well. Let the skirmish begin. With bidding online, by phone and in the room, time to take up positions. I got there, I got there, I got there. I just trampled over that poor lady up there. Is she all right? No, she's fine. Yeah. Well, I think the medics will sort her out. <laughs> He's a blunt instrument, that Phil. Talking of which, his Victorian truncheon is up first. I think it's wonderful how much pride they took in their equipment. Oh, yeah, yeah. With the painted decoration yeah. and... Yeah, yeah. Would have meant an awful lot, wouldn't it? Mm. 20, 20 and bid, 25, 30, 5, 40, 5, at 45, 50. At 50 pounds, new bidder on my right, at 50 pounds, at 50. He's doubled his money. You can't argue with that. He's got it. Well done. It's rough, isn't it? Not bad. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. The knives will be out soon. Time for a strop. Where does the expression come from? Oh, I don't know, actually. Yeah, well, you've got a strop. You haven't had one. Yeah, you've got a strop. Yeah. Hopefully from, I won't have a strop Not for much longer, though. Yeah, yeah. If it goes for a ten, I'll yeah. have a strop. Or you could get stroppy, couldn't you? 20, 20 in bid. 25, 30, 5, 40, 5, 50, 5, at 55. Ladies bid against you all at 55, and I'm selling. A tidy profit to keep Tim happy. I'm not going to have a strop after that. No. I should think not. <laughs> Under the hammer next, it's Phil's tiny painted figures. Invading Gauls and 20, Romans, they are. I quite like them. They're charming, aren't they? Yeah. I like the little box as well. Yeah, they're sweet enough. I'm just want to see if there's any Romans or Gauls in here. 20. 20 in bid, oh, 25, profit. 30, 5, 40. At 40 pounds, on commission, at 40. Uncle Phil's ancient wee army romped home. That'll do nicely, wrap it up, I'll take it. That was a nice figure. Yes. Oh, yeah. For the figures. Staying with soldiers, time now for Tim's First World War death plaque. I love death plaques. They're probably the most poignant thing about mm. First World War memorabilia, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so personal. Mm. And the story behind them, how they came into being and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yes. At 40 pounds with me, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75. At 75, in front now. Well done, you, mate. In the room, nobody else going at 75. It's another profit. They are clocking them up so far. Good stuff. That is a top result, isn't it? Not next bad at all. I'll say. The next lot is a pairing of Phil's shot puts and the Edwardian speaker. I, I said, said, Phil's Edwardian speaker. speaker. I've always thought that anything rusty you touch and it just turns to gold. Who, me? Yeah, you have a bit of a knack, knack for finding finding things amongst... Tat. Yeah. what you're trying to say nicely, isn't it? Thanks. My new best friend. 20 for them. 20 in bed for the unusual lot at 22, going. 24, 26, 28, 30. At God, 30 pounds, down Keep in the back, at 30 You're in profit. Pounds, the unusual lot, and I'm selling at 30. Not bad. I, I said... said... Oh, never mind. That was an unusual lot. Yeah. I've got to stop buying things like that. I really have got to stop buying things like that. No, you don't. Now, has Tim's Japanese incense burner got the sweet smell of success? I love the little lid as well. Yeah, but it's replaced though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's still nice though, isn't it? Yeah. 30 for it, 30 in bid, 35 in commission, 40, 45. I think you've 50, just swum at the charm, now. my friend. And I'm selling last call at 50. Thank you and sayonara. That's not your mum, is it, back there? <laughs> oh, you cheeky thing, Phil. How could you suggest it? <laughs> now, let's see how the good folk of Edinburgh fancy Phil's Edwardian satinwood table. Now, that is a sweet piece of furniture, isn't it? Yeah. And it cost me £45. It's just mad, isn't it? It is, yeah. Furniture can be that reasonable to buy. 50, 50 in bid. At £50 a bid. 55, 60, 65, 70, 75. At 75, nobody else, and I'm selling it last call at 75. They're both on a winning streak. Quality work, eh? 
you can go to an auction or an antique shop and buy a really nice piece of usable furniture for a lot less than new furniture. Absolutely right. So true. Will the wind change now on Tim's luck? His Gothic-style barometer is up next. Do you think your barometer is set to fair or stormy? <laughs> I'm hoping it makes a fair price with some stormy bidding. <laughs> 30 pounds, I'm bid for that. 35 here, though, the lady. Four. Thank you, madam. 45, 50, 55, 60. At 60 pounds, standing at 65. New bidder at 65, and I'm selling last call. It says fair, and it was. I wouldn't have been surprised if I'd have made 100, 100, 150 pounds. I think so. I think he got a bargain. Yeah. But I got a bargain as well, so I'm not too disappointed because I made a good profit. Yeah. Under the hammer now, the fine Regency mirror Phil has gambled almost half his money on. I'm a bit anxious about this mirror because it costs £95, so 120 quid. I'm just standing still. You'll be absolutely fine. I'm Don't gonna, fret Phil. I'm going to nick fretting Phil. Fretting Phil. <laughs> fretting Phil. You've got to be very careful how you say that. £80, ATM bid at £80, £85.90, £5, £100, and £10, £120, £130. At £130, standing at £130, and I'm selling. And that £35 means Phil has made a profit on all his lot. Well, it could have gone the other way, so I'm sort of relieved. That was going to be the thing that might have lost you money, and you've got out of it. Okay? Yeah, I have. I could have lost 60 quid on that. Well done. <sighs> and relax. Not you, Tim. Deep breath. Can the Edwardian Vesta ashtray with the wee golfing figure give him a birdie? I think this might be my favourite purchase that I've ever had on the road trip. Really? It's just made me laugh every time I've looked at it. Just make <laughs> And I like that you crack up about I it do. as well. And on commissions, I have to start the bidding with me at £50. Straight the golfing just came at 55, 60, 5, 70, 5, 80, 5, 90. At 90 pounds, still with me now, and I'm selling last call at 90. I think that's really good, but do you know what? If it had made 190, I wouldn't have been surprised. No, but it's sort of in the middle, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm really pleased. I mean, yeah. for a temper. Yep, 80 smackaroos definitely lands Tim at the 19th hole. Come on. Man. Thank you. Phil spent every bean of his £200 and romped through the auction with a string of profits totalling, after auction room fees, of £266.50. Amazing. But Tim parted with a more cautious £100 and drove it straight down the fairway to a fantastic score after auction costs of £374.70. He is our Open champion today. Wow, what an event that was. That was a top day at the <laughs> races. Incredible. Yeah. Did we have ten profits there? Yeah, we had a clean sheet. Ten Every profits. Lot. Amazing, isn't that? Yeah, well, you've done really, really well. I think it's cause for celebration. Come on, mate. You've done well, too.